Okay, so I want to go back to because we've been mentioning data and DNA. What do you, what do you all do to protect this data while it's all being transferred from you know here and there? Well, we do a number of things. First of all, uh, we make sure that um, only the people that uh, have have the uh, the need to see the data see the data. All right, so we respect privacy of the patient uh, or the participants. Um, we, when we send data out of our institution, we have a very um, uh, strong, uh, secure uh, data exchange system that includes encryption of the data and uh, storage of the data in the remote sites in, in protected, um, you know, protected uh, storage media. So there's a lot of physical protection of the, of the data, and there's also protection in terms of permissions for access to the data. So right now, for the most part, the only people that see the data are the people that that run the electronic health record systems, and you know they have to see the data because they're you know building and fixing things. Uh, and then the the information technology people on the other end who receive the data have to make sure that the you know the data are corrupted or that you know that they got what they needed. Um, but then after that, uh, people are only allowed to look at the data when they have a, a approval for. Um, uh, a research project that an institutional review board has reviewed and approved. Uh, of course, like with this data, it's only it's never shared with. If I come on, we were in this question right. It's not shared with your like. Is it separated from the doctor? or Is it connected together? Like, say, if I go in for a visit with my with my doctor, would it be kind of tied in? Well, so uh, if you were a patient at UAB or one of the other you know healthcare providing organizations. Mm -hmm. Um, you would come in, you'd have a visit, you'd get blood tests done, your doctor would talk to you, write a note, uh, maybe get an x-ray, the radiologist writes a report, you might get a, a lab test, a report goes in, orders are put in like for medications and, and, and so on. All of that becomes the data in your electronic health record. And then the um, patients uh, in the U.S. have a right to share those data with whoever they want. And mm. health provider organizations, whether they be a big medical center or a single doctor private office, are required to provide those data in electronic form to wherever the patients want. And I use the word patient because it's everybody. It's you, me, uh, mm. anybody listening to this podcast. So the but then as a participant in the study, we ask the participants to agree as patients to send ha have all their health providers send their data to the data resource center. And they do that. Now, a lot of places it's very difficult for them to do that. Uh, they're still trying to figure out how to comply with the law. So your, you know, your single physician practice in rural Alabama might have an electronic health record, but their ability to share data is going to be limited by that, whatever software they're using. But at a big center like UAB and our partner, other partner healthcare institutions, we have a way to pull all those data out and, uh, and share them. Now, information about the physician we don't share information about the physicians other than if we have a report that we send, it'll say who signed the report. Um, but we don't say who is this person, where do they live, what's their phone number. We only send data about the patients. Okay. So I know this is like a 10-year study. What happens with the data from after these 10 years or what happens if somebody withdraws earlier? Well, so first of all, the so what happens with the data are a couple of things. One is that people can, uh, uh, with the proper credentials, can sign on to uh, the All of Us Enclave, which is a, a computer system uh, on the internet, which has access to the data that's being collected, not just you know from UAB and other places, but whatever data is collected. If a patient fills out a questionnaire online, the patient gets a blood test and gets DNA sequencing. All of those data are available in the Enclave. Researchers can sign on there run programs on the Enclave that analyze the data, and then they can get results, summary results, which they can download, but they can't download the individual data. They can only get the, you know, the summary results. So there's no, um, no individual data released from the Enclave uh, in that way. That's kind of, that's kind of retrospective research because they're working on data that's already been collected. Mm -hmm. And some of those data might be 10, 20 years old, depending on the electronic health record that provided mm -hmm. the data. Um, then the other thing that can happen is that a researcher might say, you know, I'm really interested in studying um, a certain condition in people who have already uh, are on a certain medication or have a certain variant in their genome or what have you. And so they're going to look in the in the cohort of data to find people that seem to match their 
enrollment criteria for their study. And that would be a prospective study going forward. And okay. then uh, with the proper institutional review, re review board permission, they can then contact those people say, hey, remember you joined all of us, gave us permission to look at your data so that you could be part of future research studies. And if you're interested, we have this study where we're looking at disease X and you meet the criteria. If you're interested, let us know, we'll sign you up. And then they can enroll people and they might do that uh, nationally, uh, which might be a challenge if you have to get blood tests and things like that. But if you're doing mm -hmm. things online like surveys, you could enroll people across the country. Or if you say, gee, I'm only in Alabama, so I'm going to look for people that are in Alabama health provider organizations, and they can limit it down to that. Then once they do that, uh, then they contact the patients individually with their own research projects. And whatever they do is their own research, their data, just like we do with any research project. Now, you asked an interesting question. What happens if somebody says, yeah, I don't want to be in the study anymore? Well, they can do a couple of things. One is they can say, I don't want my data sent anymore. So mm -hmm. they can say, you know, you've got my data. I filled out the questionnaires. You got my genetic data. Yeah, okay, that's enough. I don't want to be, I don't want anybody contacting me. I don't want any of my new data to go because I maybe I have a new medical problem and I really don't feel comfortable sharing it. Or, you know, I just decided for whatever reason, I, I don't want to share any more data. They can, people can stop sharing data and still allow the old data to be used for research. They can also say, you know what, I changed my mind. I don't really, I'm not comfortable with this idea of having all my data out there somewhere. And, you know, I don't feel like I know what people are doing with it. And so if they have that, you know, if they feel that way, they can tell um, the, the consortiums, please unenroll me. And so now they'll be removed from the study. Now, what they can't do, unfortunately for them, perhaps, they can't tell a researcher who's already accessed data to undo that. So if they've analyzed the data and come up with a summary, you know, there's no way to, to pull that out of the summary. They also, if, if researchers have downloaded data because they enrolled those people in a different study, then the use of those data is subject to whatever the rules of that study are. All of us has no control over that. So if I was, or let's say you're a researcher, a citizen scientist, and you got permission to download a bunch of data, uh, identified people, got their permission, mm -hmm. got all their data, and then some of them said, hey, uh, you know, Jarvis, we don't want to be in your study anymore. That would be up to you, you know, and the, and the research subjects to decide what happens with those data. But all of us has no control over the data we've given to you once you've got it. Now, one of the things I've noticed, which is really neat about this study, is that they gave me a free Fitbit. Um, so how, like, I guess kind of tying this in, so does this give you good real time, like, the data is that from, from me wearing the Fitbit, is it being... What I'm trying to say simultaneously. Okay. Well, so so you know, Fitbit is a limited piece of you know hardware. It collects certain kind of data. Um, mm -hmm. I I used to have a Fitbit. Um, uh, I don't anymore uh, for various reasons. None of them you know bad. But I I one you know I discovered for instance that um, you know it was pretty good about telling how many stairs I climbed. Okay. Uh, but if I was in an elevator and I just moved my legs up and down like I was walking upstairs. It counted it as climbing the stairs, so I could get you know, a, you know, a, a hundred flights of stairs by just taking the elevator in the Empire State Building and moving my legs while I was doing it. So you know, it's not you get what you pay for. It's not a super accurate device, but it's pretty good. Um, mm -hmm. And in general, when you have a lot of collecting a lot of data like that, you can you know you can get the signal out of the noise and get generally get an idea. Hey, these people are moving around more, or they're moving around less, or you know, Jarvis is a pretty active guy, but his brother's not very active. Or Jarvis has been pretty active, but lately he's not moving around. I wonder if he's okay. Maybe we should give him a call. So there's a there are certain things you can do with it if you know you know what to do with it, and it's it's just another way to collect data that doesn't require you to log into a website and go, here's how much I walked yesterday. It just mm -hmm. collects it automatically. So it's just another another method for getting data about people and what they're you know what's going on with them. So with, with the Fitbit, Ryan, who's, who else has access? It's just all of us researchers that have access to that. Is, as far as I know, we don't, we don't do the transmission of that from the health provider organizations. But as far as I know, any data that's collected um, between the participant and all of us goes into the same database at the data, you know, uh, data research uh, resource center, the DRC. Uh, and then it's just like having your blood tests or the, your questionnaire that you filled out or all the lab results or, you know, that sort of thing. Do you know what's happening in Birmingham? Download the What's Happening Birmingham app today.
today on Android, iPhone, and iPad for free. Get info on everything you need to know about local news, events, businesses, restaurants, and more. Visit our website, whatshappeningbham.com, or follow us on social media at Happening Beham for more information. Download the What's Happening Birmingham app today. Your source for everything Birmingham.